what is happening and what is up. Hold out your glass, because we're about to fill it up. All things continually lead back to serpents, dragons, fairies, Nephilim, and fallen angels. In the distance looms a mystical mountain. As Mike Kaiser used to say, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's probably important. At its peak, a great fire burns, concealing the Prometheus lens. This, this development of this knowledge that's being talked about within the mystery schools. An ancient artifact said to reveal the hidden truth within a deliberately darkened world. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. Join us as we travel and explore the vast unknown. It's a hero's journey with dragons to slay, damsels to save, and innumerable treasures to hoard. Torches high. The Smithsonian, they caught wind of a giant skeleton. They would send their agents out to get it. But it takes courage to move forward, to move out of the shadows, out of the uh, unreality that we think of as reality. We are all on the hero's journey. Mankind has been in contact with and influenced by extraterrestrials. Leave the Sitchin mound of bull feathers out of it. You know, look at it from a different perspective. Different perspective. Hey there, here, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Appalachian Intel. We are extremely, extremely thankful that you guys could join us again for another week, for another edition of AI. With you tonight, you have your hosts, Justin, Ryan, and Lance. Fellas, how y'all doing tonight? Doing wonderful, buddy. Lance, how you doing, buddy? Can you speak right now? I guess not. So we're going to move on. Lance has a, he's got some kids running around right now. He's taking in a bunch of news coverage at the moment. We usually. Hey, I'm here. Jump Sorry. Right. I, I'm, hey, I'm here. Sorry. I'm on my phone. Oh, okay. I, couldn't figure out how to, I couldn't figure out how to unmute it. I just, usually just get my space bar, but that's not the case now. <laughs> so I didn't know. I was like, oh, no. What do I hear? I couldn't figure it out. I'm doing good, guys. It's been a couple of weeks since I've been on. Uh, things have been a little, little, little busy, but uh, I'm glad to be back. Glad to be here with Justin uh, tonight as well. Looking forward to the episode. And nope. yes, I you did take it. And, and you yep. did it again. We still haven't introduced him, and you jumped yeah. right in. Yeah, yeah, maybe think, I just maybe said just Justin. Right? That, could, that could be you. That could be I me. Mean, it's you. Yeah. You actually messed Look. that up. I was talking about you actually, and you you and totally I, put the cart for the horse. Everybody knows, everybody knows you're not excited and happy to record with this Justin. Okay. <laughs> So we'll go ahead and jump on into this thing. With us tonight, uh, one of our hill and holler Appalachian brothers from just over the border over in East Tennessee, we have with us tonight Justin Doc Brown himself, the host of Prometheus Lens Podcast. He's been all around the block already. He's only been doing this a little while, and he's growing big time. And we're excited to talk to him tonight. Justin, how are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, when I first discovered you guys through Bo, I was like, man, some more Southern bros and get, uh, you know, get five of us with twanging it out, man. This, we got, we got to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, that's kind of, I think, through Bo is where I first heard about you two. Actually, when we recorded with Bo way back in October for the last time, because, you know, stuff got real wonky for us at the first of the year up until about the last month or so. But uh, the last time we talked with Bo and was recording with him, we actually recorded an episode called Bigfoot Calls Lilith Mama. <laughs> and... He mentioned you, Justin. He said, have you guys talked to Justin Brown? And I was like, no, man. I haven't. I don't know that I know him. I don't know that I know the name. He said, have you heard of the podcast Prometheus Lens? I said, well, no, that's a new one for me. He said, 
go check the podcast out. Go check Justin out. You got to get him on and talk about some of these same connections that, that we're talking about because he falls right in line. So I'm glad we're finally able to do this way down the road because you've put out a lot more content. We've made a lot more connections. Uh, I think we've both actually been on the confessionals on Tony's show here in the last couple of three months or so and, and talked about some of the same things, uh, which is really cool, man. It's cool that w- when your research starts kind of intertwining with, with other people's research, especially when it's another Appalachian boy named Justin right across the, right across the mountain. So pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Oh yeah. I remember listening to that episode and I was at work and I was sitting there just working away, had my earbuds in. And as I was listening, I was like, Oh yeah, man. Oh, it was like one of those conversations you're like so into and you're like, God, I wish I was there. (laughs) But I really enjoyed that episode, how you guys just dovetailed off each other. And it was like, like you said, everything was just interwoven. It was really good to just to be a fly on the wall and listen to. Well, I do still think that we need to sit down and have a have a big round table one of these days. Us, you, Bo, get some of these guys that have some of the same, not not technically the same hypothesis and, and theories from the research we've, we've done, but a lot of connections in there. There's a whole lot of different connections that we that we found that kind of coincide with each other's stuff. So, I think we need to do that one of these days. Yeah. And how it's all localized, you know what I mean? It's, it's it's this area, man. It's just something about this area. Oh, I agree. I agree 100%, man. Well, we were talking about a little bit before uh, we started hitting recording here. So we're, we're usually not a political podcast. We don't bring politics into a whole lot of stuff. But thanks to just some call, man. <laughs> well, yeah. But just a... Uh, just a couple hours ago, Mr. Donald J. Trump himself, right? I like his glasses. So. Yeah, man. Mr. Can you guys J. see you? Himself during a Pennsylvania campaign rally. Got some shots taken at him, right? Yeah. And he's he's got his head at like a 45 degree angle kind, and he's looking, and all of a sudden he looks over to the side. And then and you start hearing shot bring it. Boom, boom, boom. Well, he reaches up and grabs his ear. Secret Service tackles him onto the ground. They pile on him. When he finally get him back up, you know, you can hear like shoot her down, shoot her down. They finally get him back up. And he is fist pumping the crowd and screaming, fight, fight, fight. So this just happened. Before yeah. we dive, before we dive into anything else, we gotta talk about this. What are y'all's thoughts? on this whole thing it just went down listen when I, when I first like we were outside in the pool i had no idea what was going on my wife comes running in and was like trump just got shot in the head trump just got shot in the head I said, what she's like yeah go ahead yeah just, I just somebody had called her or whatever so i come back in and put the tv on um and kind of it takes obviously takes a while but eventually see a little bit of uh, a small piece of the replay. So to go find the most information, um, obviously I went to Twitter and um, try to find a couple of videos of what happened. And like you kind of watch it at first and initially you're kind of like, well, that's it just, it looked kind of weird, right? The whole, it looked strange. Um, and my initial thought, you guys know my brain, right? You know how this, this brain works. My initial thought was, all right, you know, I don't, this, this is probably theater to, to a certain degree. Um, is what again, just giving you first impression, first thought of it. Um, and just kind of, kind of the way it went now, this is probably theater or whatever. And you know, this will obviously boister a lot of things for him and then make the divide essentially even more. But then, kind of like the more that I was finding more and more videos and getting more information on it, like I'm not so sure that somebody didn't try to take a shot at him and just maybe you know, he was protected or whatever from the glass that's in front of him, or they just pure mist or and it kind of seems as if like this may this again this is only an hour or so out from this it, maybe not so much theater maybe some legitimacy to it um but again who, who knows and, and and here's the thing too and i'll let you i'll shut up and let your voice talk in a second 
regardless, like we're, we're doesn't matter. We're not going to know the actual tr- truth of it ever. Like we're never, you know, we're going to hear so many conspiracy theories, so many both sides of the aisle talk about this. We'll probably never really fully know what happened either. Um, but you know, it's shocking, right? I mean, regardless, and w- Ryan, you and I recorded what, what, back in February, I think, and we said that, hey, you know, hold on to your to your pants here. This year is going to be crazy, and the closer we get to the election, the crazier things are going to get. Uh, and I think this is probably just very much kind of right down that line. I I believe so, Lance. That uh, That's my initial, like I said, I just found out earlier. But from what I've seen, I had that initial feeling, too, of theater or, you know, we know it's not the CIA because we all know they know how to kill a president. So, but uh I don't know, man. It's my uh... <laughs> Justin. What's wrong with you? Uh, that was good, man. That was good. You're one hundred percent right. Yeah, it says Johnny Kennedy. But uh, oh wait, you can't. But yeah, man, it's uh, I don't know, dude. I think the thing too, where there have been, I guess, an, uh, essentially another casualty. I guess that's as of now being reported, right? This is we're just kind of doing this in re- in real time, um, and some people that were critically injured. And to me, that you know, to me that tells me more that there's m- maybe some legitimacy to this, and it not so much, you know, if it was orchestrated and it orchestrated in a way where he just kind of got maybe just grazed or whatever. Um, but there's you know. Kind of this, some of this other stuff coming out. I saw an interview, like there's a, supposedly an interview. Where I actually watched it. One of the guys that was there was an ER doctor, and he was working on the guy. One of the other guys that got shot was trying to, you know, keep him alive. So that's and he, you could tell he was either really good at acting, which I don't think that he was. Or he was visibly like you could tell like he had just been through a moment where he was trying to save somebody's life. You you just kind of tell by the way he was talking. So I I, I don't know. Again, this is all like we're you know, two hours from it happening. So. By the time this comes out on Monday, whenever this comes out, um, you know, it'll be 87,000 other things that have been talked about and brought up. And I've already, you know, this, uh, you, if you flip over on to your trending on Twitter, you got Trump rallies like one and two, and then staged is number one or two as well. People up there kind of on both sides of that it was or wasn't staged. So I don't know. It was. It was. It, it's interesting, and I think it just again adds to the point that we knew crazy was coming, and it's just going to continue to ramp up as we get closer and closer to the November election. I think. Right, but give it a yeah. give it a couple more hours. They'll find out the name of the shooter, and then there will be so many different things that are going to come out about that guy, and this is why it's tied to this. This is who set this up. It's going to get nuts. And with oh, me, yeah. full disclosure, you know, uh, I'm a big Trump supporter, but, and I used to follow the news like religiously. And then after the, the last election cycle, I was like, I know how this story ends. I don't need a play by play. It's just going to get my blood pressure up. So I, I've honestly, I've turned off the television. So the only news that I get is like through, you know, Facebook or Instagram or, or X, And, uh, I had been working on some stuff here at the house and then I started getting like a little bit of a headache. So I was like, well, I'll just take a nap, you know, take my old man nap. And and I woke up, my phone was just blew up, you know, Donald Trump shot, you know, I'm like, oh my God. And I seen the video and like you guys said, and where I have my bias, you know, I mean, theater never, (laughs) never hit my mind. But I did see, like, it was strange. It sounded like firework pop-offs, and all of a sudden he twitches and he grabs his ear. You know, I'm like, that doesn't look like a gunshot to me. <laughs> you know, but then as I got to seeing some of the other people post and, and talk about it, uh, the last thing that I had heard before I came on with you guys was it was that bulletproof or shatterproof glass that surrounds him. That That's what got hit, and it was actually uh, shrapnel that flew and hit his ear and that even explains like some of the pictures you see it looked like a uh like a scratch across his cheekbone or, or a blood splatter but that that was the last that i had heard but he was supposedly supposed to go to uh, a ufc fight with dana white after this rally 
and I heard some commentator, uh, which he wasn't like a big CNN guy or nothing. He was just like, like us. He just, you know, like got a podcast, but it's a big platform. And he said, uh, so I tell you what, he said, if Donald Trump shows up to this UFC fight, he said with Dana White, after an assassination attempt and bandages on his face, he said the Democrat party might as well just step down and not even run. Just go ahead and hand it to him on a silver platter. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's not exactly like they're, uh, their leading candidate and current sitting president right now is, is blowing it out of the water or anything. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, we've all seen it for a pretty good while now. But it's bad when your own party is looking at you and saying, "Look, bro, you you gotta go. You gotta step down. This is this is bad." I mean, he called Zelensky Putin the other day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, I, if 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 it's true, an article I read earlier is that several donors to the Democratic Party, are, it's like so many millions have been uh, put on hold. Until they figure out how to get him out, so. And it's not not like they didn't know, you know. What I mean, they're not stupid. Yeah. If good old boys like us, with a little bit of common sense, can can see he was in cognitive decline uh, from from year one. Yeah, and you know that they're they're working with him every day that they saw this. So it ain't it's baffling point, to me that they act like they're surprised it's like dude you knew the whole time he's just been the puppet master but now th there's no denying it the whole world has seen it the whole world knows and now you're playing oh my god well, he's gotta go yeah <laughs> uh, it it's almost elder abuse you know like yeah. this dude you can tell sometimes he just don't he has no idea what he's where he's at what he's doing he needs help you know he needs to be under medical supervision but anyway, not to be biased about it. I actually, I like Bobby Kennedy, but whatever. It's <laughs> yeah, and I tell people all the time, it's like, as far as like political stuff goes, I think a lot of Christians get confused and they try to vote for a, a pastor or a pope. It's like, you're not voting for a pastor or a pope. Yeah, you try to pick somebody with good Christian values and you pick the, the, the best one that you can out of the group, but it's like, Shoot, man, you you can't argue with me. I I'll agree with you all day long. Donald Trump, you know he he'll he'll lie. He'll he'll stretch the truth. He likes to brag. He's a little pompous and he's arrogant, but he's a smart businessman. He run the country like a business. And far as my personal testimony, man, I I was financially in a hell of a lot better shape than I am right now. And the, the country was in a hell of a lot better shape when he ran it. So I'm the type of guy. I don't care what you do on your personal time, what kind of character you got. If if I have a plumbing issue, I want the best plumber on the job. But that that's just me. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm in the tank top tonight. Our uh our HVAC system decided it's just gonna stop cooling the house. So it's like eighty four in here. Uh and it's miserable. Well, just like I told you boys when we got started here, I'm in the end stage of it. Installing a brand a new washer and dryer. Right now. So we're bringing a whole new, a whole new level to this podcast today. On my phone with my buds in, scooting a dryer back right now as we speak. Here's a, another tangent. Did you guys? Uh, I don't know if I sent it to y'all or not. Did you guys see the? Uh... Did you guys see the? Uh... Video I sent of uh, the cardinal that was disbanded from the Catholic Church. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. About the Pope, he's like he's not even he's a Jesuit, he's a Jesuit, yeah. whatever. Jesuit, Jesuit. Yeah, I don't know why I was having trouble with that, but uh, dude, that well, that's a whole gigantic rabbit hole there with yeah. <sighs> Church and, and Jesuits and different popes being it, it that that's a whole. Anytime you start talking about the Catholic Church and the Vatican and the Pope, you, you might boots. as well just yeah yeah you might as well just hunker down and get ready for the next few days and be like wait what 
what? What? <laughs> yeah. that real? But anyway, I, I'll, I'll give my final thoughts on the whole Trump fiasco, and then we'll move on, and we'll let Justin do what he does best, and that's present some cool info and research. I think, again, my first thoughts as soon as I seen it was, man, this is all the This is all the You know, I'm at the point now where I'm like, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. What's real? What's not real? Either way it goes. Here's my final thoughts. I'm not a huge fan of either one of these leading candidates. You know, I do agree with my buddy, Mr. Brown, here that um, I can go to the grocery store a whole lot easier when Trump is in. And that's what affects me. That's what I care about. I had a little more spending money in my pocket when he was in there. So I like that. But I do not like that. Uh, and people forget this a whole lot. He was the sitting president whenever we shut the entire country down over all this COVID BS. He did put Mr. Fauci up there in the lead and said, we're all going to listen to this guy and do what he says. He did initiate Operation Warp Speed and still to this day talks about how successful and awesome these vaccines are and all this and that. While we've definitely, I mean, we knew then, but we've definitely seen now that's just not the case. So I do, I do have my issues there, but I'll say this. When I seen him get back up out of that dog pile and start fist pumping to the crowd and screaming fight, I'm not going to lie. That's about as patriotic as I've felt in a long time. I heard bald eagles screaming. I heard machine guns going off, not just those. I heard Mother fireworks. Three and inches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't oh, even drink man. it. Popped open a Miller Light right then and shotgun. But no, I mean, it's, there, there was something to it. I mean, and you hear these stories, and, and, and you remember back, like when Reagan got shot and finished his speech, Teddy Roosevelt take or didn't finish it. He he said a couple more things. And got if I'm not mistaken, it's right. Teddy Roosevelt. You hear all the stories about how BA that Teddy Roosevelt was takes a shot in the stomach, finishes a speech out. Like whether it's theater or not, we'll never know. Nobody will ever officially come out and say oh, this was staged and made up. There will be a shooter. There will be somebody to go to jail over this. Oh, he's it, it, dead. This, is, this is going to go in the category of Teddy Roosevelt, Reagan, one of the most B.A. acts of a president in history, in American history. And I thought before this whole thing that, I mean, if it's not crazy stolen and, and rigged in a way that's just everybody gives up on this being a constitutional republic, like, and just realize once and for all, this is a, an oligarchy or a monarchy or whatever you want to call it, or a totalitarian dictatorship, whatever it is. I thought that it was going to be a runaway landslide before now. They might as well just go ahead and, and give it to him and say, okay, look, you're you're back in office. I mean, that's there's gonna be fifty million t shirts made before midnight tonight with Trump blood running down his face and his fist in the air, yelling fight. That's just how oh it is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a fifty cent shirt, you know, uh, to get rich or die trying. And put put Trump's face on it. There you go. Put many men at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, that'd be great. All right, man. Well, let's just dive right on into this thing. Just I know that we've talked about some things uh before, you know, some of your Esau Bigfoot connections, some of these different things. I'm not gonna say, hey, let's let's focus in right there. I wanna know 
where you're at right now? Like, what are you really diving into research wise? I mean, if you want to get into the whole Esau thing, that's fine. That'd be a great conversation. But what are you really interested in diving in right now? And before we get done with this, I really got to know how you got that elongated Nephilim skull sitting right there beside of you on the table. <laughs> well, uh, me, man, I, I'm honestly, I, I'm ADHD and I'm all, I'm, the, I'm that squirrel chasing the shiny object and it, it changes often. And it's hard for me to stick on one subject you know, for, for a while, but I'll, I'll go down a trail and, and deep dive on it for a while. And then I'll find some other shiny object and trail off there. And sometimes I might venture my way back to, to the old hole and pick up where I left off. But, uh, honestly, like here recently, I've been, uh, studying up on, on the mounds and stuff. I've been reading, uh, Fred Zimmerman stuff. Uh, but that's honestly because, we got a conference that we're going to in Ohio at the end of the month. So I planned on uh, using his traveler's guide and checking out some of these mounds. I just got me some uh, new cameras and, and some drones and stuff. I want to start doing some, some documentaries and doing some, some work with that. So I planned on uh, checking out some of these, these mounds that's uh, along our way to this conference and uh, record some of that stuff. So, I've been looking into some of the, the mounds. Uh, I recently just met up with uh, Chief Joseph Riverwind, and uh, he's actually like 15, 20 minutes from me. And uh, he actually lives in my hometown where I was born and raised, you know, for, for many, many years. It wasn't until my uh, mid-20s that I moved away. Uh, so I uh, talked with L.A., and he hooked me up with uh, Chief Joseph and his wife, Dr. Laura, uh, Laura Lynn. And, uh, we actually just met up last weekend and I recorded with them and, uh, we talked about the mounds and some of, uh, the native traditions and things like that. That was really good. But, uh, are you guys familiar with the, uh, the Nephilim Lance? No. Well, uh, L.A. Marzuli, and I can't remember when this was. It was a few years ago, and it was at a, a conference, uh, the Serpent Mound Conference. And him and uh, Chief Joseph was there, and this guy walks up and tells L.A. he has a uh, an ancient uh, bronze sword that he had found in Michigan on native land while he was camping, and he wanted him to check it out and see what he thought. And the, he pulled this thing out, and it's just, you know, I'd say it's probably, guesstimation, like four foot, four and a half foot long. And it just looks like a huge, like, stone uh, sword that was just broken off. And it was just wild, and he said he stumbled across it. He said and it was basically just, like, sitting on top of the ground. It was buried a little bit, but it was hanging out, and he said he pulled it out, and he was like, man, this has to be a sword, and this thing's wild, and it weighed, like, 26 pounds. So it was a big, and, and L.A.'s like, yeah, man, a, a giant must have wielded this thing. It's huge, you know, and uh, Chief Joseph goes and looks at it, and he said, and as soon as I seen it, he said, I knew. He said, it wasn't no sword. He said, because it's it's elongated but then at the end it was uh it came in and then back out again wide and wrapped around like the end of a, an arrowhead tip and he said so for my people my culture and stuff he said i knew right away he said that this was a, a spearhead that it went on a shaft and somebody you know wrapped this thing around and connected it to the shaft he said but then when i seen the size of it and the weight of it he said you know it, it takes you know 26 pounds and this is just the head he said, and the first thing that come to my mind was the, uh, I can't remember the, uh, the native tongue name for it, but it was the, uh, the stone giants or the stone skin giants. He said, my people had these legends of these giants that had really tough skin. They called them the stone skins and that the only thing that was unprotected was their face. He said, and we have all kinds of native, uh, uh, cave art of them showing shooting for the face that's the only way you could kill them but they carried these huge spears and he said and they would spear the natives and get 
two, sometimes three Braves and just impale them and just stab them like a, you know, like a shish kebab and then just keep going. And they could get two to three Braves on this pole. And he said, as soon as I seen it, he said, that was the first thing that came to my mind. He said, and it matches the depictions in, in the cave art. He said, so, uh, there was no doubt in my mind. He said, this is exactly what this was. This was, a a, a Nephilim Lance. And I had seen it in the, the documentaries that LA had done. And I seen pictures of it because I got that L.A. Marzulli book. Uh, it's uh, it's like over three hundred and something pages of just full colored images and maps and this thing. I mean, it's it's like a Bible. It's that thick, but th that thing is in there with a lot of pictures of him and Chief Joseph and all these people. And so I was familiar with this object. And so we set up to meet, and of course I brought brought the skull, and I, I take this with me. Anytime I go to like a conference or, or something like that, I call him Ed the Head. And uh, I have, you know, some of my Nephilim hunting friends sign it. So I got Chief Joseph and Dr. Laura Lynn on here. I got Ellie Marzulli, uh, Derek Gilbert. And hopefully by the end of the month, Dr. Judd's supposed to be at this conference. So I'm going to have him sign it for me also. But uh, you asked about this school. I actually found this on Etsy, believe it or not. And it's just a, a, a casting uh, of some sort. I knew that's where those damn Nephilim were hiding. Yeah. <laughs> Etsy. But I wanted one. I got to look and I'm like, dude, Etsy has all kinds of weird stuff. I wonder if they got it. And sure enough, man, it was, but it was like a, uh, like a spook or Halloween type uh, store that sells, you know, creepy stuff. <laughs> dude, that's awesome. That is awesome. But when I took it to show L.A. at the last conference I went to, where he actually signed it, he flipped out. He was like, oh, my gosh. He said, this is the Paracas skull. Where did you get it? He said, "He said, I, as far as I know, he said, I have the only casting of this skull. He said, uh, uh, Joe Taylor done it for me. He said, well, me, him, and Judd, and Aaron Judkins, and all of us went down to Peru and studied these things. And I said, well, I said, I found it on Etsy. I don't know. I said, if the guy just did like a like a scan or or, or made a, a replica off pictures or what but he was like it's amazing he said i've i studied this skull i've held it in my hands many times he said everything's correct on it he said the proportions he said the 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 skull cap lines the teeth he said everything's identical they did an excellent job that's awesome man yeah that's awesome the an etsy find and it's so like genuine like it's yeah. so close to the yeah. original Baraka skull. That's that's yeah. really cool. Because if you look, it's got the uh, the skull cap lines here, but it, it's missing yeah. that Sadra Sutra, just like the real one. Right. And then it's got the, uh, that Formus Magnum here at the back. Even that anchor point is correct because in them skulls they found the anchor point was all the way here in the back, and in a normal skull it's here. Yeah. So even all the ones they have are that are proven to be head binding, that anchor point doesn't change. So the, all that stuff matches up with this thing. But that I wanted to, cool. yeah, but I wanted to take that and show it to Chief Joseph and and have him sign it. But when I pulled that thing out, he said, uh, "Oh, you brought something for show and tell." And I said, "Oh yeah," and uh, he said, "Well, I did too." And like I said, I was familiar with this, this whole Lance, but I was told and what I'd read that it was some random guy that, that brought this thing to that conference and he reaches in his car and he pulls out, uh, it looks like a pool stick bag. And the first thing that popped in my mind was that Lance. And I looked at him and I said, dude, is that that Nephilim Lance? And he does, he grins from ear to ear. And uh, he said, it sure is. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was freaking out. And uh, he, he got a kick out of it and got to laughing. And, but he said that that guy was going on a mission trip out of the country. And he gifted it to Chief, to Chief Joseph at that conference. And so it was in his possession. But uh, he actually had, uh, he had the original and then he had a replica made. And he brought both of them. But he had just got back some documentation and he had to cut that beveled piece at the end off because you got to cut a piece off anytime you do any kind of 
uh, metal work testing or carbon dating and all that kind of stuff. So he said, it killed me, man. He said, but I had to cut it. He said, but I wanted to get all the information on it. And he, uh, read that thing off in that, uh, video that I had done with him, but they found out that it was, uh, uh, pure bronze. It was 26 pounds and, uh, the, the, the metallurgy and the composition of it traces back to, uh, the Middle East, and it was found in Michigan amongst these famous uh, copper mines that uh, a lot of people believe that the uh, the Phoenicians were coming over here and mining. So it was just a- amazing. Wow, that is crazy. There's a there's a crazy connection there too. You guys remember when we talked to uh, uh, shoot, what was his name? Adam. Oh, uh, Stokes. Adam Stokes. Stokes. Right? Is that right? Yes. That was way, way, way back in the day. We'd only been yeah. podcasting for a little. And he was talking about finding some Semitic language, some Semitic writing on a some, some form of tablet. or so. It's called the Michigan something but it was the same kind of location up there around those copper mines that that you know folks believe that the Phoenicians were in there and they were doing all this so that's a really weird connection that this lance comes from this same area to where Adam Stokes and several other archaeologists at, at this point you know linguists and, and you know experts in language all these people have found this this tablet or this whatever whatever it is with this well, yeah, it's like a paleo hebrew phoenician type language uh even in that same yeah. area where uh, america stonehenge is uh, the stone family they own that and some of those little caverns and stuff down there have like collapsed in on themselves well the owner uh I had some bobcats and stuff come in there and try to lift some of these huge stones to get in there and see what they could find. And in there, they found uh, what they've uh, labeled the uh, the bell stone. And on there is all this. It looks like paleo, uh, paleo Hebrew or you know uh, Phoenician style script. And uh, Doctor uh, Kerry Fell, I think his name. He's from Harvard. He came and examined this stone and actually deciphered it. And it said, uh, to Baal uh, of the Canaanites, we, uh, we dedicate. So it had a direct connection with the Phoenicians. And uh, in one of the documentaries that uh, L.A. had done, he talked about how uh, once the ice caps melted, or maybe even before, but either way, there was a time in history to where around the New England area where the water was so much higher, it led in uh, inland into the Great Lakes. And that is how the Phoenicians were getting in and out of there and making it to Michigan and getting this, this copper from these mines. And Michigan copper, for those you know that are listening that don't know, has a distinct marker. It's the purest copper in the world, and it's like ninety-eight point like five percent pure, and it's the only place in the world that is like that. And they're finding this copper everywhere. They're finding it all throughout the Middle East, out in Europe, and it's showing that you know they were transporting this stuff back and forth. And there is a a pillar also. Um, it's next to the pillar of Hercules, and they had found it and on there had Phoenician script also. And it mentions, uh, Joshua and Caleb from the Bible. And it says, we, the Phoenicians, uh, lay claim to this spot. And, uh, because we were run out of our homeland by, by Joshua and Caleb, uh, the great robbers. So it, it's basically saying that during this conquest of Canaan, when they were going after these giant tribes, uh, the smart ones packed up and ran and fled 
and spread throughout the earth. And that's why you get all this Nephilim giant and huge architecture and stuff uh, just throughout the world. It's just wild. Man, that is wild. It is wild because we see, you know, we see monolithic structures in Central and South America. You know, we, we see these examples of, of carvings and, and structures and these giant rock walls that look like there's no way that they can be naturally formed. You know, we have our petroglyphs, our rock carvings right here in our hometown. That I have, we, we still have no idea where they came from. We have no idea who put them there. But we know for a fact they're not natural. And when you can't, when you start looking at all of these different, you know, every culture has like a certain, a certain style to their artwork, to the way that they, you know, whether it be rock painting or sculptures, you know, each civilization, each culture, they kind of have their own style. And when you find something that you can't really match up to anything, it starts making you think, man, like, how old is this? Is this like, you know, something that, that, that's been here a few decades? Or has this been here thousands and thousands of years? You know, it's one of those things. And, and a, lot, a lot of these monoliths that have been found, you know, that we're starting to find, in Central and South America. And, you know, some people claim even like places like Montana and, and around, you know, the West and the Midwest, they look a lot like these sites like Gobekli Tepe and Karen Tepe and, you know, a lot of these places that, you know, most of us in this little niche realm that we're in, we think, oh, yeah, this is for sure. Nephilim created, watcher technology, like it's pointing to these old gods, these signs, these all these different things. You know, you're starting to find that, man, this is all over the world. Are you a hunter or hiker or prepper or just someone who enjoys the great outdoors? Whichever case that may be, Squatch Survival Gear has you covered. Not only is this a veteran owned company, all of the products are 100% made in America, baby. All the way down to the fabric in every stitch. So whether it's a day hike, a weekend getaway, or the ultimate bug out bag, head on over to SquatchSurvivalGear.com and use the code PLP10 for 10% off store-wide. Yeah, it was just a global network. And it shows you that... Uh, either one of two things or maybe even a combination of both is that, number one, these were ancient seafaring people and people were traveling throughout the, the world, continent to continent, long before Christopher Columbus. And, I mean, that's a good example of why uh, in Egypt you have depictions of, of corn and, and you find cocaine in some of these pharaoh's tombs. This is not stuff that's indigenous to this part of the of the world. And, and so then you got any logical, smart person, the first question should be, well, well, how is this or how did it get there? And then you read in the Bible about when uh, Solomon reigned uh, during the, the Feast of Tabernacles, everyone would, would show up and pay tribute. And they'd bring all these grand gifts and all this gold and this copper and all these materials. That's where they were coming from. And uh, even mentions this distant, like unknown land called uh, Ophir or Ophar. Uh, I've uh, read some material on people that they believe that that is North America. That they were going over there and mining this copper. And, and once again, going back to, to the Michigan thing, I can't remember how many, uh, uh, I don't even know how to say it, but basically, uh, six uh six figures and more like into the billions of pounds of uh copper that is missing that they know is missing from this this area and these copper mines that they, they've scooped out where's it all at and then you yeah. find you know you hear stories about uh 
all these Egyptian artifacts and tombs found in the Grand Canyon. And then, I mean, it's in Smithsonian uh, documentation. I can't remember the guy's name now, but the Smithsonian paid and funded for a guy to go out to the Grand Canyon and explore and find these things. But then you don't get the reports. The reports have, have gone missing. But now you have sections of the Grand Canyon that's owned by the government and sectioned off and you can't go to. <laughs> that's because of all the Egyptian temple stuff there. <laughs> yeah, it's possible, you, man. You're speaking of uh, government entities owning areas, too. I, I, was, I don't know if I heard this or read this the other day, but go Beglia Tepe or however you say it. I'm not good at saying it, but do y'all know who, know who owns most of that land or owns actually uh, owns the area? Yeah. The yeah. World economic um, yeah. Forum. yeah. The world economic forum. And what, what reason do they, I mean, why do they need to have that for? Right. And that's exactly. the reason they don't, won't allow them to excavate it anymore. Right. Because they say they, that everything's they, there. They, yeah. Or no, they know that they're going to discover some kind of watcher tech at some point here. And if anybody's going to find this tech and get super powerful, it's going to be the World Economic Forum. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they deliberately covered it up and put, paved and done concrete walkways and built that permanent structure, uh, that uh, roof over the place. And they had to drill in, probably destroying all kinds of stuff underneath it. And I think it was like, you know, when it was first discovered all those years ago, it said like only 7% of Gobekli Tepe had been uncovered. And uh, through all their ground penetrating radar, they found like over, I think it was like 22 different uh, enclosures. And uh, some guy did a YouTube video and he was like, you know, this was, you know, way back in the day. I wonder what the percent is now and looked and it's still at 7%. And that's when he got to digging and found that the, the World Economic Forum owns it. And they say that they are preserving the site for exploration of future generations. So basically we're making a lot of money off this tourist wise. So we're just going to uh, not kill the cash cow here. And I'm sure like you guys talk too, there's some more nefarious stuff at hand, of course, but m money's always a, a big thing. Oh yeah. yeah. In almost every situation scenario, if you follow the money, you get to the, to the bottom of what's really going on. I mean, in, in most cases. Yeah. yeah, and Gobekli Tepe, man, it's just crazy to me that when you look into that place, uh, it was deliberately buried. Why would a civilization go through all this trouble of, of building this place and then to, to bury it? One of my favorite theories and things that I've heard on that is that, you know, because Gobekli Tepe is right there in what, southern Turkey, right? Yeah, it's really, close really, to where the boat yeah. landed. Right, exactly. So that's one of my favorite theories on this whole thing is that one of the sons of Noah, you know, probably Ham, because we know that, that there's somehow – whatever's going on there with ham we know the ham was cursed we know that ham was kind of the black sheep out of the bunch we know that that some corruption kind of made it back into the world after the flood through that bloodline you know it, it's the same bloodline with with uh kush and nimrod and all of that you know going on into that that Babel bloodline we'll call it the Babel we bloodline Justin, we've talked about this. Ham's wife was yeah. a Nephilim. Possibly, yeah. That's very possible. I, 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 that's I what mean, I believe. We know, we know that that they were on the earth after. I mean, Genesis 6 tells us that. So there's one of two options. Well, three options. We've also said that maybe they're jumping in their spaceships and were just orbiting the earth waiting for the floodwaters so, <laughs> yeah that's but, true uh, let me let him before we let me clarify what i said there too i don't ham's wife wasn't maybe a nephilim but she had the nephilim gene or bloodline within her dna bloodline. Right, yeah. yes correct yeah but that's one of my favorite ones is that ham or you know some of the, of the family there had actually went to uh 
this this place of go back to Tappy. And, you know, maybe when the waters started receding and, and kind of going away, he found this great structure and started finding what I believe is the reasoning that the World Economic Forum has bought it up at this point, started finding some of this, you know, watch your tech, some of these, uh, some of these things that Noah recognized and said, well, no, this is what got us to where we are in the first place. Let's cover this bad boy up. Like that's one of my favorite theories is that Noah himself was like, uh-uh, this, this needs to be tucked away. Yeah, These iPhones like have too much porn on them. Let's <laughs> destroy this. <laughs> which I've often wondered if it was, uh, which you know there was some you know astronomical stuff involved here. You had these huge structures with no roof, so they were designed to to stargaze like an observatory of some type. And then you have the uh, constellations and stuff depicted on it. I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, Graham Hancock uh, documentary on Netflix. You know, he goes into that talking about how uh, Scorpio and all these other, you know, constellations are, are depicted on these huge T pillars. But I wonder if it has something to do with like Stargate's portals, if it might be like an, an ancient CERN, so to speak. Could be. I mean, that could be. And uh, that, that, yeah, that's, that's a whole nother nice. rabbit trail. But <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, if you look at, that's one of my favorite theories, again, on, on Babel, is that oh, yeah. you know, it was actually, or, or maybe it was some sort of tower. Maybe it was some sort of, of ziggurat or, or pyramid or, something along those lines, but what do we think a lot about the pyramids in Egypt and Central America today? We think that they were some kind of, of, of energy producer, conductor, you know, whatever. Well, what, if, what if these were some kind of stargates? What if they were able to conduct some form of energy, some, some something there that we just aren't grasping or can't grasp? That were like these these stargates. So if you look at Babel, which becomes you know Babylon, it's where it begins. If you look at Babel, if you take the last part of that L, you know, meaning God or gods, but Bab means doorway or gate. Yeah, gate so of the gods. Gate of the gods. Babel means gate of the gods. So. Who's to say the Gobek of the Tepe isn't some form of ancient CERN or or ancient Oak Ridge to where physicists are telling us today, yeah, we're trying to open portals. Yeah, we have stuff that's coming from somewhere that we don't understand. We don't know where it's coming from, but it's here. Yeah, we're losing particles and molecules and we don't know where they're going. So yeah, I could I could get fully on board with some of these ancient sites being being some sort of, of stargate. Actually, our, our good buddy Joel Thomas just done an episode on Free the Rabbits, his new podcast about Nebuchadnezzar and stargates and all this different stuff. So y'all go check that out. Too. It's good. Well, there's a re- like there's a reason too, right? I and mean, there's been plenty of there's been plenty of towers built from the time of Babel till now that. God doesn't care how high they are, right? Mm-hmm. That there was a reason that, that he said we must go down and destroy this and confuse the language so that they won't do this again, right? There, there wasn't just the fact that it could have potentially been super high and trying to reach heaven, but there was obviously a, a very important reason that God felt the need to come down and destroy it and make sure that the people's language was confused as well, right? There had to have been something more than just them building up there <laughs> that was going on. It, it only makes sense that, that would have been been their case. And I well, want you know, to oh sorry. No, you go go ahead, Jess. Oh, I was just gonna say that uh when I was studying into the Freemasonry and, and that led into to alchemy, uh one of my first thoughts with, with CERN was is CERN also like a, a modern version of ancient alchemy? 
because I was a big dummy. I just thought, you know, it's the rumble stilt skin. It's the turn and draw us into gold. But when you actually like look at it, it it's a, yeah, there's a, a physicality to it, but the, one of the major components, it, it's spiritual alchemy. And so you're taking this, this black, you know, ointment or this black stone, this black mineral, and you are purifying it and you're mixing, you know, this mercury and stuff. And so you're, and it's the, the combining and marrying of opposites to create this philosopher's stone. And when you look, you know, when I read that, my first instinct was, golly, CERN, what do they tell you? They're taking two opposites and marrying them together. They're, they're colliding two opposites together. And, you know, and especially when you go into the Indians and the Hindus, you know, they firmly believe that it's 90% spiritual. So instead of just one male practicing alchemist, they pair them up male and female. So that way you have uh, the opposites marrying together to create this thing. So not only is it spiritual, not only is it, you know, the, the divine male and divine feminine coming together uh, to create this new creation, but there's also uh, astronomical ties there's when you get into these ancient alchemist texts, there's certain seasons that uh, are prime for different types of creation, and they tell you because it's all about the uh, the alignments of, of the the heavens, and during these times and seasons is when you know Mercury is more powerful, you know, and all this type of stuff. So there's so much of this stuff that's intertwined, and maybe that's why. You know, CERN won't run for a year, a couple of years or whatever. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, they start up. And it doesn't help the, us conspiracy theorists either that they don't fire up or run forever. But when they do, we have these crazy tornadoes and storms and earthquakes. And then they, they don't turn that thing on for God knows how long it was this last go around. But uh, sure enough, as soon as this uh, solar eclipse comes they fire this sucker up and run i mean th yeah. i think there's something to it it is weird i agree with you there's there's definitely something to the the timing of, of when they crank this thing up and then all the weird events which don't get me wrong I, I mean i know weird events happen all the time and people like us you know we we try to see weird in everything you know we try to make these connections sometimes where there's not connections but more often than not you know we're observant enough to see like okay a is happening what what's the result of what's b going to be you know what what's the result of this going to be and like you said more often than not when CERN fires up it's not just weird stuff but it's really weird stuff you know, these earthquakes, these tornadoes, these, you know, crazy lights going on in the sky. Some cities that are like turning crazy colors of green and orange and, and all this different haze that you don't see on a, a regular basis. So it is weird. Like there's something going on there and it's not just happening in Switzerland and France or, or in the skies above Geneva or, or whatever. It's, it's all over the world that this is happening. So I'm with you. Like it, there, there's definitely something going on there. And, you know, what if a, a bunch of these other particle accelerators that we have worldwide, because they're everywhere. There's hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, of these one things. of the first ones was in Tennessee. Yeah. And, and Oak Ridge right there. Like there's hundreds of. Them. So who's to say that these things like, you know, CERN's not the big boss and they say, Hey, look, we're firing up right now. We need the rest of you guys kind of fire up and do this and that. What if, what if they're all firing up at the same time and kind of syncing up, you know, again, going back to the pyramids. That's what a lot of people, that's what I believe, that these things were like syncing up in some kind of old school, you know, the way that we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all these towers and stuff today. I believe that's kind of like how these pyramids were. Yeah. So these particle accelerators might be along the same lines of what these Again, the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. 
Mm. What we see today has happened, has been around before. Mm. And what's the deal with Shiva? Yeah, for real. Why is Shiva well, outside it, of Science Observatory? You know, she's the, well, the, the, the great destroyer. You know, the right, big relationship it talks about, you know, this destroyer coming out yeah. of the pit. And if you look into Hindu mysticism, she basically dance. She's the, the dancer. She dances and keeps everything in sync. As long as she dances and the music of the spheres, you know, it goes back to the Pythagoras stuff. Everything stays in order. But when she stops the dance, everything falls apart. And it's like, well, yeah, that has nothing absolutely. to do with what you're doing. Why is that there? <laughs> absolutely. And then you have the mock sacrifices that are going on, like, you know, in front of the statue, you know, the mock sacrifices that just so happened somebody broke in and caught on camera. I, I don't know. Do you have a lot of stuff? Well, I mean, how about just its location in general? It's literally located right there, right on top of the ancient temple to Apollo. Okay. You go to the book of revelation, Apollyon, right? Abaddon. It's going to be released from the abyss in the end time to come back into the earth and, and do as he will for a, a certain amount of time, a set amount of time determined by Yahweh. You know, it says an angel is going to bring a, a key to the abyss and unleash this. <laughs> Why do we build the world's largest particle accelerator? Put a bunch of these statues and worship these old gods. Put it right on top of the temple to Apollo, which is Apollo. And then tell everybody, yeah, I think that, that we can open portals or open portals. You know, one of the directors there, uh, Sergio, or what's, what was his name? Sergio. Bernucci or something like that, I think. He literally said at one point, yeah, there's a possibility that that we can let things in and out of this world. I mean, what? <laughs> it's crazy, dude. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. And, it, and you hear the stories, too. I can't remember. It was some... It was either some high school or, or college kids, like when they first, you know, started, they allowed them to have a tour. And these kids come in and, you know, with their phones and their cameras and, and was taking pictures and stuff. And, you know, this could just be a made up story, but I, I read it somewhere. I think it originally came out like on Reddit or something like that, but, and they actually posted a picture and the story, the way the story goes is that inside was a glass case with, uh, a parchment with some kind of like unknown language or script written on it in this glass case. And this student took a picture of it and it went out all over, you know, the, the internet and, uh, once they realize that this thing got out, it's like they scrubbed the internet. They got rid of this thing. You couldn't find it no more. But the the way the story, and, and like I said, I read this a long time ago, and it could just be a bunch of made-up stuff, but the way the story went was this was one of the first things that was produced when they fired up, and that it was basically like handwritten instructions from an entity on the other side, giving them instructions and knowledge and telling them how to to do this thing. So it was basically their, their first letter of, of, of orders or instructions from the other side. And then you get off into this whole Hitler stuff too. You know I mean? It was huge occultism and they were, you know, there's stories of them, uh, doing these sexual rituals and these women delivering, uh, ectoplasmic babies. I just recently talked to, uh, Steve Quayle and, uh, and that we released that episode already, but he talked about all that stuff and that these ectoplasmic entities that they gave birth to would dictate to these scientists and give them knowledge and tell them how to create all these, you know, different things and all this knowledge. And these are the same scientists that were 
brought over to America and had their name changed and brought them into NASA. And that's where we had some of the, the biggest ex explosions of, t of technology in, in our lifetime, for sure. It's just wild, man, looking at all this stuff. And it's really just like is. out of a movie. You know, you see in the movies yeah. that they're going around trying to find this spear of destiny, the Ark of the Covenant. And I mean, that stuff was real. They were, do they were really looking for this stuff. It's like Sam Tripoli says all the time. It's like every single movie ever created going on all at the same time. That's, that's what the world is. Yeah. Well, you know, you're talking about Hitler, and, and we mentioned the, the Temple of Apollo and how Stern builds his place. But Hitler, one of the, the biggest speeches that he ever, you know, the, the video that we get all the time of Hitler's speech where he's like, you know, really getting after it. He's got this crowd of you know thousands and thousands of these Nazi soldiers and supporters. He's doing it from the altar of Zeus. So again, you're throwing in you know some of these these old gods and Hitler being super into the occult, and that's been occultism for as long as occultism has been around. You know, probably well, shoot, since since the fallen angels come down on Mount Hermon and started teaching me and mankind some of these things like that's that's always been the the drive and, and the push and the pull there is we want this knowledge we want this information that we cannot come across on our own terms we can't figure out here in this realm so we need to contact these higher beings these these other intelligences these other uh agencies in, in this realm that's that's superior intellectually to us that's what it's always been that's what hitler tried to do that's what people in ancient times tried to do you know it's what people i believe like these people CERN in this language this script that you're talking about that's what they're doing there today so i mean it's like again it's the same old same nothing ever really changes it's just you look at it you see what it is you call it for what it is and if people just understood that the most high you know, he re he'll reveal these things to you and jesus tells us you ask anything in my name you shall receive it right so we don't have to go to these lesser beings that's already been defeated the most high will give us this information if we ask for it yeah absolutely you guys want a fun tangent on Hitler? Is you can trace his bloodline. His father was the illegitimate son of a well-known family. It was like Berenbergs or something like that. It was super German name. Um, anywho, they, they come from the Rothschilds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hitler was a Rothschild. Sure. Holy shnikes. Well, dude, and he two. didn't kill himself in a bunker. He died happy in Argentina. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. World War II, like any other war, was a banker's war. That's all it is. Oh, they all who owned, the, who owned the banks then? The Rothschilds, right? That's why they would, when it looked like uh, Hitler and the Nazis and the Axis powers and all these people, when it looked like they were going to win, they were supporting and funding them like crazy. When the tides turned and, and America entered the war and they started funding Britain like crazy. Like that's just that's the way it goes. Hitler's own family turned on him at that time and said, All right, well, it looks like you're gonna lose. So we're picking the winning team here and uh, you'll just have to we'll, we'll we'll give you an escape route to Argentina. Yeah. yeah, and if you notice, too, all the ones we attack, all the ones that need some freedom, you know, or all the ones that have weapons of mass destruction, they're all the ones that don't have centralized banks or allow foreigners like the Rothschilds and stuff to come in and set up international banks. And without fail, after every single one of these wars is when the Rothschilds and these international banks move in. Without fail. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Happens every single time. Every single time. I don't know, man. It's it's you start looking into all this stuff, and it's it's really 
it's crazy. It's wild. It's amazing to think that <laughs> we live in the time and the age and the, and the place that we live in today. But, man, it's so interesting. Oh, it's, yeah. It's such a time to be alive right now. Well, you know, it and says, you know, in the book of Revelation, you know, it says, in the end days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and knowledge will increase. The old men will have dreams and the young men will prophesy. And when you get into the whole, you know, procession of the equinoxes and the ages and stuff, we're at the verge, if not already, because it's hard to tell, but we're in the very least coming upon the cusp of the sun being housed in Aquarius, the age of Aquarius. And what is Aquarius? It's a man depicted pouring water out onto the earth. And you have DARPA and uh, uh, genetics testing and, and just, you know, epigenetics. And you have the whole Clinton emails. You know, it says plainly in there that the whole Iraqi war was over an artifact. And that artifact was the tomb of Gilgamesh mm -hmm. slash Nimrod. Yep. Yep. That's true. That is true, man. Well, and, and you look at it. We've been in this this age of Pisces now, and you see, you know, Jesus come and, and do what he did and, you know, be the ultimate sacrifice and, you know, take control and full dominion and authority over everything in heaven and everything on earth. Not that that's going to change. That, that's not what I'm saying. But you've had this age of Pisces almost where you see, okay, the church, the church itself, it's going to grow. It's going to learn. It's going to obviously be persecuted, but it's going to grow to a point and you're going to have people rise up and stand up that are going to be there against whatever comes against them, right? And as we go into this age of Aquarius, as we move out of Pisces, and you know the symbol for, for Jesus, like he tells Peter, you know, you were a fisherman, but now you're going to be a fisher of men. You know, it was this fish symbol. That's the that's the Pisces symbol. Is this is this fish? But you start looking around and you start seeing the rise of all this neo paganism. You start seeing there, there's not really. You, you talk to people nowadays. Nobody's really an atheist. It, everybody, it, it's almost like the ancient times, right? But everybody believes in God. It's just what God do they believe in? What God do they worship? What yeah. God are they into? You're seeing this rise of neo-paganism unlike any time that I can look back through history and, and see other than ancient times, you know, Old Testament times and, and before. Because, me personally, dude, there's so much weird going on. We have, you know, social media and, and podcasts like ours and all these this content that's out there where people are hearing these stories they're seeing these videos they're 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 seeing all of these experiences that all these other people are having you know and, and you can say what you want the veil's getting thinner or this or that or, or whatever but the rise of neo-paganism is is going through the roof and I believe, I mean, personally, again, it may be a little woo-woo, but whatever, I believe that it's that that entrance into this new age. That oh, I agree. That half people are, are really, for the first time maybe ever, witnessing and, and seeing that, you know, there is a spiritual realm out there. It's just which spiritual realm are they going to choose to follow, to get behind, to see, and Again, that's our job, you know, not to, to beat anybody over the head with a Bible or to say, you know, not to go on any kind of crusade, but to say, like, look, yeah, there's a spiritual realm out there. And, yeah, these gods that you worship, they exist. Like, not, 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 Don't be like the church that I grew up in and, and, you know, the traditional modern day church today to say, oh, this is just false idols, this is all made up nonsense, you know, yada, yada, yada. No. We, yeah, Paul, the only way to, when he went to Mars Hill, you know, all them gods, he didn't deny all those gods. He said, yes, you Greeks are smart people and you, all your gods, you know, yeah, they're powerful, remember? But he said, you got this one yep. statue over here to the unnamed God. I know who that unnamed God, be, God is and he's the supreme creator. 
Yep. That's it. That's it. Paul knew it. You know, the, definitely the Old Testament writers, you know, the Second Temple Judaism and, and earlier, that they knew it. Like They understood that these, these other gods, they're real. They exist. They're out there. But you have a Most High who, again, has full authority, full dominion, has his foot on the throat of all of these other lesser gods. But again, we have to, that, that's our job is to relate to these people that are searching, that are really looking into this spiritual realm again, maybe for the first time ever and to say, no, yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from. But let me tell you about the one that created them. That's where you really get on the level with, with some of these, these pagans. When you can sit down and you can talk to them about Genesis 6, when you can talk to them about divine council theology, when you can Deuteronomy talk to 32. Deuteronomy 32. I mean, Psalm 82. Yep. When you can sit down and you can talk to them about these things and, and say, you know, this is what the Bible says. Yeah, they're, they're there, but they're lesser than me. And then you tell them a little story about, like, you know, the statue of Dagon. <laughs> you tell them about these things where biblically and historically it's shown that the most high, that Yahweh himself, has conquered and triumphed even long before Jesus came on the end of the picture. You know, it's hard for a lot of people to believe the gospel. But when you can meet them on a level that they're already thinking of when it comes to divinity, then you can start really having the conversation. And a lot of people are just not familiar with how they do that. Like a good example. I had a, a woman, she was an older woman. Uh, Chief Joseph posted a clip from that interview that I had seen him. And this older woman said, uh, well, why is this guy, uh, if he's a Christian, have his show named after a pagan God? And, you know, I explained to her, you know, it, it's an allegory and uh, it's, a, it's a, a play on words, basically, that, you know, fire was symbolic for the knowledge. And Jesus said, my people suffer from a lack of knowledge. So we're, we're stealing the fire back and uh, educating uh, the, the body of Christ with a new perspective. And uh, she was like, well, isn't that mixing, you know, Christianity and paganism? And. I would love to see her face when she read my next reply. Cause I, I told her, I said, uh, I said, I'm not doing anything different that God himself or the biblical writers have not done already. I said, it, it's a proven successful method and I'm just following their lead. I said, if you look at the creation story, I said, the spirit of God hovered over the, the waters of the deep. I said, that word deep in Hebrew is to home. I said, to home is a cognate of Tiamat. Who's Tiamat? Tiamat was the chaos dragon of the Marduk Babylonian creation epic. I said, so they borrowed their language, their belief system, and encased it into their own to show Yahweh's superiority over their God. And in that way, they read a story that they were already familiar with and we're, and we're more prone to accept at the same time. I said, and that Babylonian creation epic, I said, it is older than the Genesis account. I said, then when you look into the story of Jesus, I said, he's turning water into wine. He's telling his followers to, to drink the wine, that the wine is his blood, and eat the bread, the bread is his flesh. I said, all those things are echoes of Dionysus. That also predates Jesus. Yep. Yep. I said, this was a Greek world that worshipped Dionysus, and they had all these cults. So they used language and things that were appealing and that the, the, the culture of that time knew. And think about it. If you're trying to spread a, a new gospel and you go to them with something they've never heard of, it just totally off the wall. They're, the, the likelihood of them rejecting it is very high because it, it'd be like a foreign god is invading their land. They're much more prone to accept something 
that they're familiar with. And I think that was all part of the divine plan because it said Jesus was the, the plan and the foundations when the foundations were laid. And it's just a lot of these, these themes and these ideas and, and things like that. It's just the, the body of Christ they are just, just not familiar with. And I truly believe that if they are, not only will it solidify and strengthen their faith, it also gets them out of that uh, blind faith stupidity chair. You know, how many times do you grow up in church and you see a guy that good Christian believes wholeheartedly, but they've not searched these things out and found the evidence to back up their belief. You know, as uh, first Peter three fifteen says, always have a, a reason to, to basically defend your faith and justify what you believe, but do it with gentleness and respect. So when you get these atheists come up and they tell them, you know, Jesus is a carbon copy of Dionysus. Dionysus had apostles. Uh, he told them to drink his blood and eat his flesh. You know, uh, the creation epic, it's a copy of the Babylonian creation epic. Here you go. Here's the proof. It's older. And then they're sitting there like, uh, they have no way to defend that because they've not looked into it and, and done their due diligence to, to search these things out. And, either they lose their faith and you see that so often you see these people do youtube channels and search things out and they find out this stuff that sounds similar and predates it and they abandon their faith like that or they just shut down the conversation and get made fun of and they're they're called the the dumb christians you know the the caveman christian so i mean it, it's important to know these things and search these things out because you never know who's watching a conversation that you're having with somebody that throws stuff up like that and you can back it up and defend your position intelligently uh, a non-believer that's watching from the sidelines if you flop and look like a big dummy and can't defend your faith not only do you look bad you've ruined the chances of someone else that's an onlooker to to being saved you've become a stumbling block yeah, I agree. I agree 100% with that. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like, again, you know, talking about, you know, the, the, the writing of the Bible and borrowing from some of these older texts and some of these, again, it, it's just like, you know, commentary or anything, uh, of a of a Christian source or sense in this day and age, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff in there that we relate to the culture that we live in. I mean, it's no different than at that time. They would have promoted things and, and spoke of things and written things that people would recognize, that people would know, especially when they could do it in a way to show Yahweh's supremacy over all these other gods or these other creators that these different cultures and civilizations had you know when you could when you could say that yeah over the waters of the deep over the, the, the waters of this this chaos dragon but Yahweh was his spirit was hovering above that and he was going to do something with that and you know when Jesus again can kind of relate himself to Dionysus. The problem uh, that's where we get. The problem is people see this and they say, oh, well, there, there's an older text out there. So that means that the Bible must have just copycatted this. And, and but but no, it just Yahweh hadn't seen the point of uh, writing it out yet. I mean, he was he's there from the beginning. He created all of it. I mean, these he, fallen you know, angels these, were too. You know what I mean? After, these fallen angels knew they were there, I think, uh, trying to be a stumbling block. But what well, the well, enemy uses for bad, the Lord, Lord turns for good for those who love him. He allowed them to shoot themselves in the foot. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, you're exactly right. You're 100% right. And yeah. we know that they were there because the book of Job tells us the morning stars were there shouting with joy when he laid the foundations of the earth, right? Those yep. morning stars, those were the angels. So, yeah, they were there. They knew, and, and they started trying to twist and swindle from the get-go. But again, just like you said, we turned all that for the good. And 
I think just like it was a divine plan to write it out and make it relatable for people to see and read and study and, and be discipled by some of these teachers, stuff that they can relate to. I mean, if it's, again, just like you said, if it's something totally foreign, well, they're going to shut it down. This is ridiculous. Then you have the, the crusade because you have a, a, a church that say, no, we don't like this bunch. So they're not going to believe what we believe. Just wipe them out. Yeah. I and mean, Jonah, you know, a lot of people overlook that whole uh, preconditioning of the other gods with Jonah. Uh, Nineveh, modern day Iraq, uh, once you look through the history and stuff, you see that they worship this god called Dagon. Well, Dagon was depicted as this half man, half fish, merman god. Well, some of the depictions even show a fish with its mouth curled up and the upper body is like coming out of the fish. Well, think back to Jonah. What happened? He was swallowed by this great fish. This great fish washes up on shore, vomits him out. And you know, the people saw this and he walks in and says, repent from your <laughs> evil ways or the Lord's going to destroy you, you know, and all this stuff. And they're like, this is Dagon, or this is very at least a prophet of Dagon. We're going to listen to him. So once again, oh, God used, I, I, you know, to his advantage. Yeah, that's good. I've never even, I've never even thought about that. That makes absolutely perfect sense. Yeah. And, uh, what I love the most about the Jonah story, you know, apart from from that, I mean, that's my new story. <laughs> what I love about the Jonah story is, you know, God comes to Jonah and says, "Go to Nineveh." Jonah's running from it. It's absolutely not. You know, goes down to, to Tarshish. And jumps on this boat, right? And it's set, you know, this great storm hits, and they're all casting lots. They're trying to figure out who's at fault, all this and that. They go wake Jonah up, and Jonah's like, all right, look, guys, it's me. I know what's going on here. Y'all just going to have to throw me up. Right? And, and they start, you know, they, it says that they're all crying out to their gods to stop this storm. They're all crying out. Every person on that ship is crying out to their gods. And they go to Jonah and they say, hey, you're a holy man. You're a man of God. We, you cry out to your God and ask him to stop this storm. And again, you know, Jonah says, well, I'm not crying out because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to run from him right now. I don't really want to talk to him. But y'all are just going to have to throw me off here, right? Well, they do. Storm stops. And what's it say? It says that everybody on that ship believed. And Jonah's God. And they, what? They worshiped and celebrated. So, this is an instance that one prophet, you know, one man of God that's trying to run away, that's being totally disobedient, that's doing everything in his power to go against God's plan at that time. Through all that bad, God used it for good and saved every single man on that ship that Jonah got. Mm, awesome. I haven't thought of that. It's awesome. Yeah, it is. You know, you need to go back and comment to that lady and ask her if she brings in a spruce tree during winter solstice to celebrate the new year coming. But she's yeah. celebrating the birthday of a guy who was born in the like April time frame. Yeah, <laughs> September eleventh, three BC. Mm. Gosh. <laughs> but no, like that's what I told her in that comment. You know, I said, you know, I said, if you're trying to avoid paganism, I said you're going to have to lock yourself in your house, kill your electricity, and and never come outside. I said <laughs> that's not what the Bible tells us to do. I said the Bible tells us to to be the light in the darkness. To let your light shine forth, we're supposed to be that that shiny, bright city on the hill for all to look to. So, if there's only five people in a house of twenty with a flashlight, and we're all curled uh, curled up in the the basement uh, with the door locked, everyone else is blind because of our selfishness and hoarding the light. That's not what we're commanded to do. We're we're to go out in the world and be of the world, but they're in the world, but not of it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. This is... <laughs> Sounds like he's got a little girl chatting to him. Uh, a guest appearance here by the, my littlest, Riley. Just a guest appearance. <laughs> And she's going to come on the screen. You know, I've been here. We go. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're a hundred percent right, Justin. One hundred percent right with with all this. I mean, there. We can't look at everything that's been done. We people get so caught up, so caught up in being this. This standalone, I'm going to just be by myself and of myself and, and take my religion here and hunker down in it. And all of that is, is, is usually tradition. It's all usually tradition. Man, when we read the Bible for what it is, and when we get that personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, and we do it in a way to where we're we're really seeking first the kingdom of God. Man, the stuff that can come from that is, is amazing. The places that you'll go, the places that will take you, the doors that he will open up and let you just step right through is amazing. The conversations that you can have, the people that you can talk to, you know, to, to share the gospel, to wear those, those shoes that are ready for the gospel. It's amazing, but you have so many people that want to take every little fault and flaw and wrong that they can find in, in anybody. And a lot of them are fellow brothers and sisters, so they can't even get along with them. We have, we have a church that can't get along with each other. And I was actually, I was delivering a message, preaching a sermon the other day, and I mean, I remember, usually I don't remember a whole lot of what's said because the Lord really does take over when you ask him to and then let him. But I was preaching a message the other day and I said, look, guys, I'm just going to be totally honest. With you. There's a lot of people sitting right here today, right now, that there's no way in the world that you would go a mile and a half down the road and attend this other church. You, you wouldn't even go sit in for a service because you can't stand their, their theology, their doctrine, their bylaws, some of the people there can't stand it. I said, if we as a church cannot come together and love each other, be compassionate with each other, then why in the world are we working to get to heaven? You realize yeah. these are the people that you're going to be going to be segregated. You're, yeah, talking you're talking There's crazy. You're talking crazy, Justin. There's not going to be a Pentecostal corner uh, and a Southern Baptist corner and a free will corner and a Methodist corner. Yes, there no, is. We're, we're all children of God. We're children of the most high. And we Would can't the Southern Baptist be a trailer park subdivision? I guarantee it. I guarantee <laughs> yes. it. It'll be some good food. Son. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's a sad state that we're in. But it's a state that I feel like, you know, guys like us, that's what we're called to do. We're called to bring this to life, to talk about it, to be honest and vulnerable about it, and to say, look, we can do better. He commanded us to do better. And this is where we got to get to if any unbeliever is going to look at it and say, you know what? I'd like to be a part of that. This is a place, a, a community that I want to be, that I want to join. It's not a bunch of miserable Christians that hates every other denomination, but a body, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ coming together in unity. Man, nothing in the world can stop. And honestly, man, I tell people all the time, in my opinion, it comes down to humility and honestly minding your own business you know it's, it's almost like a pharisaic spirit uh 
you know, I'm holier than thou and I'm, I'm miserable doing all or following all my do nots. And you need to be just as miserable as me following your do nots. And I think that's what the whole message of Jesus, when he was saying, you know, those without sin cast the first stone. Why remove a speck from your brother's eye when you need to remove the log from your own? And if we're humble enough, I mean, seriously, if if we do some serious self-reflecting and we see how screwed up we really are and we're honest with ourselves, we have our hands full trying to keep us in line. And if we're doing a good job of trying to keep ourselves in line, we don't have enough time to look at anybody else and cast judgment and try to fix them. So if everybody just minded their own business and once they perfected themselves, try to work on other people, then everything would be fine because everybody would be minding their own business. <laughs> That's yeah. just my two cents. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree 100%. Because it, it is, it's humbling. Once you, if you're honest with yourself, you, you see how screwed up you are. Yeah. You know, your sin might be looking at pornography or having a lustful eye at other women. Well, that's kind of a private sin. That's in your head. Most people don't know about that. You can hide that very well. You could be the preacher in front of the congregation every Sunday and deal with that sin and nobody know it. Versus the guy that never has a lustful eye, never looks at pornography, but he might be dealing with a drug addiction. Well, that's a little bit more visible. That might be the only sin he's got, but man, that's on front row display for everybody to see. But he's the one everybody focuses in on and and gives such a hard time to. So if you're honest and see how screwed up you are, and then know that Jesus loves you, that your Father in Heaven loves you and forgives you, as long as you're seeking Him with a humble heart and asking forgiveness and trying your best, then that should humble you. And know that, you know, as screwed up as you are, God loves you. He accepts you and forgives you and walks with you daily. So, therefore, that should put you in a very humbling position to where you don't look at other people all haughty and, and from your your high place looking down on them. Because you, you're, you're going to be just as low as them if you have that mindset. Yeah, man. And he already covered you. Yeah. He already spilled the blood that covered you and covered all those sins. You just have to seek him. You have to ask for forgiveness for those things. And he's faithful and just to forgive. And when again, when you realize those things and you look at the big picture and you do this self-reflection, it is. It's a humbling experience. And that's the problem. There's there's not enough self-reflection going on. Everybody wants to point a finger. Everybody wants to to take right to social media and all this different stuff instead of sitting down and saying, okay, I've got a problem here. I've got a problem here. I've got an issue with that, this person, that person, with this organization, this group of people. What's the common denominator? Yeah. Usually it's us. And we are the common denominator. And when you figure that out and find that out, it is. It's, it's, a, it's a humbling experience. It's oh, humbling. I'm the asshole. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Pinocchio when he goes to Pleasure Island and he pulls that hat off and them ears come out. You know, he's the jackass. Oh, <laughs> there you go. That's it. Which, well, by the way, that this theory just... that <laughs> I agree. I'm just kidding, Jess. <laughs> uh, but that theory, another tangent, dude. Just one of those that blows my mind. Speaking of Pinocchio on Paradise Island and all the donkeys, remember the little redheaded kid that didn't make it? Uh, they theorize that's Donkey on Shrek. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. That is a singing and talking flying donkey. <laughs> hey, and he, he mates with chaos, man. Yeah. Oh, he totally does. He embraces the good. chaos and mates with it. <laughs> and by the way, I may be convinced that Mr. Beast is the Antichrist. Oh, when we were talking about Trump earlier, I was going to say this and it slipped my mind. I was like, I'm waiting for the Trump hating conspiracists to be on uh, Facebook, Twitter, X, and everywhere. And it's probably already going on. I bet you we could probably look and find it. Trump is confirmed the Antichrist. He took a mortal head wound and it's going to be miraculously healed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you know it's coming. <laughs> you know it coming for sure. Well, we just made it all the way back around full circle. I feel like that's a good place to close this thing in. This has been a fantastic conversation. Yeah, I've enjoyed I'm myself. Amazed. I'm amazed that I was able to stay locked in like I did, which is always easy to do when it's a good conversation. Yeah. But, uh, no joke there, Hill folk. Uh, if the audio on my end is terrible, sorry. Again, I'm on my phone, earbuds, and I was finishing and stuff on a washer for the first, you know, <laughs> hour of this conversation. So, on my end, sorry. But at this point, I mean, y'all know what you get. We're not spending hours of production time trying to get this thing. We're not like Justin, his awesome studio and his rock of skull and, and all his <laughs> Super awesome reels. Y'all got to go follow this dude on Instagram. Check out all of his reels that he's putting out. All the, man, I'm telling you, the content is just, it's great. Like, Justin, honestly, I'm not just trying to blow smoke while you're here. Dude, you've got this whole thing down. Like you're growing like crazy. You're going to continue to grow. You're already one of the, the leading voices in this space. People go to you, look to you, and they're going to continue to do that. And the content that you put out is a thousand times better than anything that we put out. The only thing is, is again, you know, you're finding that that fan base, that that loyal group of listeners that just, you know, they want to hear, they want to hear the conversations. And that's you got it all figured out, man. Honestly, no joke. Everybody, all you heal folks. And I'll let him plug his own stuff in. Mean, but right now, go to Prometheus Lens Podcast. Give him a five-star rating and review. Tell him that the Hill folks sent you. Go subscribe to him. Follow him on YouTube. Go to all of the socials that he's at. And I'll, again, I'll let him plug all, everything in a minute. But before you ever even get done listening to this episode, you can pause it and come back to it. Go find this dude, Justin Brown. Prometheus Lens podcast. Give him all the love because, as you can hear in this conversation, this episode, if you haven't heard from him before, the man is a wealth of knowledge. He's a wealth of knowledge. He's a strong follower and defender of the faith. He's a brother of ours. And that's been before we even got to talk to him here tonight. He, and he's been persistent. We've, no joke, we have giving him the cold shoulder for a long time now. And it's not, you know, intentional. Like, hey, I, we don't really want to talk to this guy. You guys know our lives have been nuts. So if we if we get an opportunity to record, it's a miracle. So for all of us to be here tonight, for this conversation to happen, to have Justin on here and to be able to finally do it and do it in a way that that I feel like has been a extremely beneficial conversation. We threw out a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of crazy here tonight, but we also talked a whole lot about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I'll shut up. I'll quit rambling. Justin Brown, it was great to have you here tonight, man. Thanks for coming on here. Thanks for being persistent and, and staying in this, because honestly, that's what we have to have. But before we jump out of here, go ahead and plug your stuff. Tell the Hill folk where they can find you, the best way that they can help you out, and share whatever you need to share. Yeah, well, first off, man, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I, I knew that we would uh, get along great. You know, we're we, we're Southern boys. We, we got the twang. We like uh, diving into the fringy stuff. And, yeah, we, like you said, we, we, we covered a lot of ground and a lot of – uh, strange territory today but we, uh, we keep it christ-centered and that that's what i try to do you know with my show and uh, th thank you for for all the kind words man uh it's uh it's a labor of love and so when you when you you love what you do it, it shows in your work and it doesn't never feel like work so i i really enjoy cutting the reels and doing what i do and having these conversations so so thank you for Allow me to come on with you guys and talk. I really enjoyed myself. But yeah, just 
the, the podcast is called the Prometheus Lens Podcast. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, anywhere you can, can consume content. Uh, I'm on all the socials, uh, X, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all those places, TikTok. Just search up uh, Prometheus Lens Podcast. You'll find us there. And uh, so if you liked it, today's conversation, that's what it is. It's everything from, from aliens to Jesus to ancient history, theology, uh all these things, but they are filtered through the Bible. And I, I say that it's, it's an allegory of the Prometheus lens to take a second look at everything filtered through the Bible. And, uh, I've kind of coined it. I call it the hero's journey. You know, Campbell talks about, uh, you get a call from the self to, to go out and go into the unknown and you take off on this heroic journey and you face your fears and your demons and you, you slay the dragon, you rescue the damsel, and you take something with you of value from the unknown. And then you have to go back to the surface and share that boon with the world. And th that's why in my uh, logo, I have the, the picture of that zombie looking guy in a cave with the flame behind him. It's the, the allegory of uh, the cave of Plato. And so, yeah, if you guys enjoy this stuff and uh, I try to have conversations that even non-believers would enjoy and I, I don't beat you over the head with the Bible, but I do filter these things through the Bible and through my Christian lens and uh, try to point the way while I have your attention. But it, it's not a an AM Christian radio station where I'm going to beat you over the head with the Bible. It's going to be good, enlightening conversations, but Christ-centered. So, uh, yeah, if you guys just come over and check me out, I'd appreciate it and, uh, see what you think. Heck yeah. Go check him out. Hill folk. Definitely. I'm planning a, I'm planning a hero's journey here soon myself. <laughs> nice. Totally <different>. <laughs> totally I, I'm not actually going to Nashville in the morning to, uh, Ron Wyatt's uh, museum. And oh, I'm nice. uh, getting a chance to, uh, uh, Richard Reeves is his, uh, childhood best friend and went with him on all these explorations. So he's going to, uh, give me a tour and sit down and have a conversation with me tomorrow. So I, I'm looking real forward to that one. That'll be my little journey for the weekend. <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. You folk definitely go take check out Justin. You know where you can find us all socials, Facebook, X, Instagram. YouTube, Discord, all those places. Uh, share the show. Again, keep leaving those five-star ratings and reviews. That helps out the algorithm like crazy. Uh, share the show any way, you know, the way that you're most comfortable sharing it. Spreading the word is, is the best way to do it. Uh, it just, it, that's, that's always been the way and, and always will be the way is just spreading the word to, to the people that you know. Uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can support us a bunch of different ways. You can click the, the you make a one-time donation, click the support the show link there in the show notes, or you can go over and check out our Patreon. Uh, there's a new feature now that's in the show notes where you can actually send us a text message through our podcast platform and just tell us, you know, what you like, what you don't like, what's just whatever you got on your mind. You can share it right there. It's a quick little resource that you'll be able to do that. Uh, but yeah, that's it. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all listening. Thanks for continuing to keep coming back every, well, I can't say every week because we take breaks all up. <laughs> but uh, thanks for being there when we're there. That's the main. Fellas, this has been a great conversation. I love all you boys. We love you, Hill folk. And until next time, we'll see y'all later.